Good evening and welcome to Cafe Muse. Thank you, Michael Davis, for sharing your gift of classical guitar with us. It's a wonderful escape. And the photos, oh, farm equipment, clothes drying on the line, um, blue cabin on a pond, fabulous images. I'm so pleased you can all join us for our annual WordWorks DC Alt reading. I'm Renee Garrity, and I'll be your Cafe Muse host tonight, along with Susan Oki, our behind the scenes technologist, I think I made up that word, Luther Jett, and our special co-host, Barbara Goldberg. In just a few minutes, Barbara will introduce our featured translators, Curtis Bauer and Nancy Naomi Carlson, who are both nationally and internationally known. Curtis is actually coming to us from Spain tomorrow. It's 1 a.m. there, August 3rd. Um, if there is enough time after the readings, we will take a few questions from the readers, um, for the readers. If you have a question, place it in the chat. Your microphones are muted to keep the inevitable phone calls, dog barks, and doorbells silent for our readers. We encourage you though to use the chat function and are the emoji functions uh, throughout the readings there. The icons are located at the bottom of your screen. Our guest host, Barbara Goldberg, is not only an accomplished poet and translator herself, she is the series editor for the WordWorks International Editions. She's the author of seven prize winning, winning poetry collections with breaking and entering new and selected poems forthcoming from the word works. The Royal Baker's Daughter from the University of Wisconsin Press received the Felix Pollock Poetry Prize and Transformation, the Poetry of Translation from Poets' Choice Press received the Valentin Khrushchev Translation Award. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Goldberg to the screen. Barbara? So I just want to welcome everybody and um, to say that the reason that I'm so much into translating is because when my mother was a kid and boys used to visit the house, this was in Czechoslovakia, her mother always used to ask how many languages does he speak? And that was a sign of good breeding and intelligence. So I guess that kind of stayed with me. Anyway, the WordWorks has been publishing international works since its inception in the 70s, but on a very regular basis in the last decade. And uh, we've been going from languages like Kurdish and ancient Greek and Croatian, and last year an indigenous language from uh, the border of uh, Argentina and Chile. And tonight's readers, Curtis Bauer and Naomi, Nar Naomi Carlson are both poets in their own rights, as you said. And in fact, Curtis Bauer has a new book of his own poems just out called American Selfie from Barrow Street Press. He also has four books in translation, but tonight he'll be reading from his WordWorks book, Image of Absence, uh, by the Mexican poet Jeanette Clarion. By the way, it was uh, awarded the International Latino Book Award for Best Nonfiction Book Translated from Spanish to English. Nancy Naomi Carlson, is own, her own poetry is, uh, her latest collection is An Infusion of Violets, and it was named New and Noteworthy by New York Times. And she's about to have a new translation appear from the two-time Man Booker finalist, Alain Mapangpu from Congo, Brazzaville, and the title is As Long as the Trees Take Root in the Earth. I should mention that um, Curtis splits his time between Spain or Basque Country and Lubbock, Texas, and if you want to ask him about it, do it after the show. And tonight she'll read from Cal Turabuli, Cargo Hold of Stars, Pulitude from Seagull Books. And she also received two literature translation fellowships from the NEA. So why would obviously accomplished and professional poets want to get into translating? Well, for one, it's fascinating and exacting work. And two, people love to travel, to immerse themselves in another culture, another time, 
another mindset. And this is exactly what translators are called upon to do. Any artist is a world builder. The, he constructs or she constructs a universe, and there we can briefly dwell. It brings the real, wider world to us in all its sense of revelation. These explorations into foreign climes ultimately contribute to our own imagination. And travel now is especially tempting after being confined to quarters because of the pandemic. In these times, what better way to feed your wanderlust than by taking a virtual trip? Tonight, we're off to Mexico and Mauritius. Mexican poet Jeanette Clarion takes us on a daring metaphysical journey to explore the dark recesses of the soul. Lest you think this is a solo self-obsessed trek, her truth is that one cannot come to terms with the human condition without being inside, inside the beating heart of absence and silence. Let me say that Clarion and Tora Bouilly could not be more different from each other, both in subject matter and in style. Clarion believes absence is a presence to be reckoned with, and that uh, resonance of silence and the image of absence. Paradox is emblematic of a greater truth that the sun both soothes and parches, and poems are born in silence. There is nothing certain in the sky, she writes, nothing, not even these words. Whereas Torabouilly's poems are suffused with presence, he gives voice to the millions of coolies or indentured workers. His language is playful, invented, and peppered with Mauritian Creole slang and newly minted expressions, a language and poetics he describes as coolitude. His strategy is much like the court jester, flamboyant, much wordplay, and fooling about. And that's the way he chooses to deal with horror and terror through humor. For someone who extols silence, Clarion shows again and again her mastery with words. They can be ecstatic. I sink in the desire to lose myself in the lake that shifts about me. Where does my being abide? Clarion sinks, in short, into eroticism that is not housed in the flesh. I eroticize what I touch, except for flesh. My desire is so great. Curtis's deft translations keep a pace with her deep dive into the mysteries within her. Curtis? Thank you, Cafe Muse family, crew, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this morning here, tomorrow, as, uh, as you all said. Um, uh, it's a real honor to, to be reading these poems uh, of, of Jeanette. Uh, she's, uh, she's very dear to me, a dear poet. Um, she's a translator herself and an editor. She's a publisher of a press called uh, Basso Roto Editions um, that's based in Madrid. And in, and in Mexico. And this book that, that Barbara was, was uh, describing so eloquently um, is actually one, it's a book length poem. So I'm going to read uh, a, few, a few sections from that poem uh, tonight from across the whole book. And I thought that I would also uh, read a poem or two of my own, uh, which I think identifies the connection, my connection to translation, my love of language, my uh, kind of immersion in it, in the different languages that I speak and don't speak or however, however that works. And if there's time, possibly uh, beginning or ending with a a poem by an Argentine poet that I'm that I'm translating, which is in one of my uh, uh, latest projects. But I'm going to start with um, uh, some some of the sections from uh, from Image of Absence, and I'll start with one in Spanish, uh, so you can hear the Spanish. Extraviada miré la tarde contra el viento desnudo. 
las hojas caídas escuché. Vacía, Emily, ¿es real que la tarde se vacía? La poesía es ausencia de agua, puerta que abre otra puerta y otra y una más. Nada entraba en mis ojos o en mi lengua que no fuera belleza. Tomé un cuaderno, un lápiz afilado, encendí una vela en plena luz, salí a caminar por calles oscuras, el horizonte se abrió lento ante mis ojos. The same poem in English. Lost, I watched the afternoon against the naked wind, listen to the fallen leaves. Empty, Emily, does the afternoon really empty? Poetry, that absence of water, a door that opens another, another, and yet another. Nothing entered my eyes or crossed my tongue that was not beauty. I took out a notebook, a sharpened pencil, lit a candle in full light. I went out to walk the darkened street. The horizon opened unhurriedly before me. The sun will strike the cheek you turned, though nothing dignifies the offense more than one's own bitterness. You laugh, scornful laughter, wash your hands at the moss-covered water wheel with the shame of a god who wishes to wipe away the purple stains of the universe. Lord, why does your hail destroy the innocent clover? O oh, sea, give refuge to my helplessness. And the wind cried that ours would be misery. Ila nec misere moriatur, nec omino moriatur. His smile was silver sheen on the low rock, encrusted squall in my entrails, her gaze the mallard flight on which I ascended the ancient mountains. Fearless, I lingered in his eyes, falling into his waves. Memory fills its voids, birds the sky. I return to my mother's shattered gaze, its dark phrases, a gale staining the bedding in the courtyard, flakes of soot shrouded the peach tree. The train whistle is reminiscence, a tree's sincerity. Only the word restores quietness, there where essence perfects its shimmer. You spoke to me, I heard your lament, your hands covered the photographs. You looked down, don't open the door, leave me alone. My father turned on the TV and looked at it as if staring at a wall. December, never open the door, say I'm not here. The door opens other doors leading us back, I said. A flame illuminates our steps Starlings of immense geometry, their blood on the canvas veils the whiteness of space. Entering the thicket does not make us dear. Stone that I let die on my path, I too was a stone, silenced like the beginning of its resonance, and the word is key to illuminate the edge of what no longer is. Pietra morta in pietra viva, in guisa de om pensi y en pagna iscirvi. That night I dreamed of featherless thrush, an enormous womb, red violet, viscid, fell from my body, the octopus and its suckers. That night multiformed undulations, the sea succumbed to illumination. Elizabeth, let me walk with you along the shore. The wind erases our faces, born from rocky breasts. I want to contemplate the monument, the cliffs, the foam's scattered silver. Of all silence, I prefer the sea. Slowly, the sound of water sways. After my death, Nothing will remain. There will be no memory of me. I too lie alone, a shadow spilling into a single depth, slow pace of the Cayman. 
longing of geese for the sky's immense hollow. I said thirst, and the beach turned silver. I said orchard, and the olive tree burned. I'll read one more here. Tell me about another light. The shard is on the ground. I'm afraid of the wreck. A river of birds swerves around the gravestones. Fear, always fear of the tolling bells crowning the island. You sit and watch the shoals, lilies twisting around the room, wounding me. From that wall, the voice scrolls, the faces of the dead I loved. They come back like dusk, chill on a solitary bench at the piano. Over there, the storm's radiance came to life. I wish I'd never been born. White fire floated that day in the splendor of the moor. At dawn, you listen to the blind man's cane, and you do not dare isolate it from the flame. So um, I'm going to I'm going to read a poem from American Selfie, which I I call a, a translatica. A, it's kind of after an Ars Poetica, but it's 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 looking at or kind of giving giving some space to the art of translation. At least that's how I look at it, how I talk about it. And um, so often with writing and with, I mean, in particular with translation, you know, we have lots of choices that we make and those choices uh, usually aren't seen. So in this particular poem, I, I make them visible. And initially in the, in the epigraph, I cross out the choices that I'm not using. So what I'm going to do as I, as I read it, I'll just do this to show what I'm crossing out and then I'll do this to show what I've chosen. But then with the rest of the poem, um, I'm not making any choices. I'm just giving lots of options. So you're going to hear those options. Um, so this is, this poem is titled um, Border Selfie. So um, this is the epigraph from El Pais. The images of 187 immigrants racing through the Tarajal Pass on Monday, which showed two agents kicking and hitting the foreigners with cudgels, truncheons, clubs, generated initial responses yesterday. The left demanded the interior minister clarify, dilute, water down, rinse, shed light upon the episode, occurrence, blip, incident. And the unity party accused the executive, executive order, executive branch government of lying to hide, disguise, dissemble, efface, obscure, paper over, cloak, place out of sight, bottle up, conceal, the police procedure, operation, intervention, involvement. Several ONGs reported, blew the whistle, informed, decried, tattled, reported that there was an unwarranted, unfair, uncalled for, unmitigated, wrongful, unjustified use of force. The cameras here caught, captured, understood how a policeman hits, bashes, bonks, buffets, smites, whacks several men, and how another policeman tripped, hindered, deterred, and kicked, gave low blows, gave golden handshakes another, which caused, produced, engendered, occasioned, inflicted, provoked the breakage, fracture, rupture of the tibia and fibula of his left leg. This, despite the fact that hours before the government blamed, attributed, imputed these injuries on to the violent attitude, bad, laid back, mental, negative, relaxed, outlook, animus, mindset, posture, carriage, artificial horizon, theatrical manner, stance, cautious approach, change of heart, condescending manner, low profile, openness of the foreigners who mowed down, swept along, dug underneath, crushed, destroyed, brushed aside, dominated the uh, officers. 
last Monday, a group of close to 200 illegals hurried away from, through, into, foot raced, over, rushed, scuttled, across, hurtled, over, dashed, away from, through, into, the border crossing. After security forces had deployed, extended, spread, stretched, unfolded, unfurled, opened out, dropped down, taken wing to another part of the fence where the only blind spot, corner, wall, side, cesspool, double blind in the perimeter is found, located, bumped into, blundered into, come across face to face with, in contact with, discovered, encountered, happened, on or upon, met, with, up, with, run, into, against. One side says, one side says it's unacceptable to try to stop the entrance of migrants, immigrants, and possible refugees based on, on the basis of through, by, hits, bashes, bonks, buffets, smites, thwacks. The other side defends, for their part, the actions of the officers, classifying, labeling, marking, rating, scoring them as fitting, good, polite, correct, proper, regular, right, right-minded, well-formed, right and proper, right on, wide of the mark, politically correct. Okay, I'm gonna read just one more, one more poem in translation. And this is by uh, the Argentine poet, Clara Muchetti. And um, the, the title of the book in Spanish is Podría llevar cierto tiempo. This could take some time is how, how I'm, I'm uh, translating that. Um, so the title is, is uh, or the first line is also the title. Let me introduce you to my night of peace without love, without fireworks, it's afternoon, but the night, the winter secrets I told, my secret has a vein. I'm the first in a tournament that no one cares about, like the daughter of parents recently separated. I'll let anyone caress my head. It's just that a heart like this, in these circumstances, is a dizzy heart, beaten. I have a beaten organ inside me, battered, fucked up. I'm rude, but necessity, just as life is with me, is literally, it literally shaves my head. No, let me introduce you to the kind life I would have liked. I was born, pretty much I lived. I live, pretty much I shiver. The reflection of the water tints this part of my soul from here, and it damages what I call being adequate or the way of life that corresponds with the idiosyncrasies of other people. Inside every person, there is another person who thinks more or less the same thing, but in another language. Thank you all. So thank you for that deep dive into another universe. And from the opposite corner of the world, we'll hear Nancy Naomi's translations from Mauritian poet, Carl Turabuiz, is that my pronouncing that right? Yeah, his book, A Cargo Hold of Stars, Kula Tube. Now you get five extra points if you can tell me anything about Mauritius. I don't know, if you're like me, I had to go to a map and find it. And just for your information, it's an island nation in the Indian Ocean and I learned from a friend of mine, this will really knock your socks off. It has a club med. Tora Bouilly, Bouilly, he was born in 1956, a poet, essayist, film director, and author of some 25 books. And he's practically unknown in the US. His book is mainly about redefining coolie, which is a pejorative term I first learned when I was a child and read Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Stories. Tour Bouilly has taken this derogatory term as his own, reimagining, redefining the concept and coining the term coolitude. Coolitude is even in the title of his book, a kind of proud statement. He felt that ordinary language is not sufficient when giving voice to indentured workers and their horrendous experiences. The humor of his linguistic acrobatics creates a kind of tension that underscores the violence he is describing. 
Nancy Naomi is uniquely suited to translate his work. Her sensitivity to sound is key, plus her own imaginative playfulness. She too is on a hunt to discover unknown territories. How else explain her fascination with poets from Djibouti or Congo Brazzaville? The thing to know about Nancy Naomi is that she never sleeps. She teaches graduate counseling, is a prolific translator, and she writes her own poems before breakfast. That, and she also contributes to the translation community by serving on the board of the American Literary Translators Association, and she's active with PEN America. Tora Bully's focus is on giving voice to the hundreds of thousands of indentured workers, or coolies, from China and India. Some either stayed in Mauritius as a cheap source of labor, or were sent overseas to the colonies to work the sugar cane fields. He coined the word uh, coolitude, much like M.A. Cesar's coining the term negritude. He argues that indentured workers or coolies, through their rich intercultural exchanges, developed a new and resilient identity and language worthy of dignity and pride. His is a poetry of dispossession and loss, cloaked in language at once playful and inventive. The wordplay and humor of these linguistic acrobats underscore the violence and tragedy he depicts. And I'll close with this quote from him. I call for the corpus of coral, and the sea fell into a shell. Salam. So long, sooty men. Namaste. Here's Nancy. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for that introduction. I don't know why I sent you my bio. You ad libbed so nicely. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cafe Muse and Karen for this longstanding reading series and uh, Renee and Susan who are here and, and Ellen and, and um, I'm grateful to be able to be reading from Kao Talabuli's Cargo Hold of Stars with um, the graphics done by Shunandini in Calcutta, India. Seagull is located there and they do gorgeous work with their books. And each book we await the design for what it's gonna look like. Um, before jumping into Tarabili, I wanted to read one of my poems to make the connection of why poets translate. Um, I think that what also attracted me to Torah Budi is even though he has that humorous stuff, the, the puns, the neologisms, he also is writing about serious and, and tragic things, horrible things. Um, and I, I'm known as a dark poet, but I try to lighten it up a bit. And I'm always struck by the sense that every time I write a poem, I think I'm translating myself. And in fact, I did write a poem called Translating Myself. This one is a villanelle with those repeating lines and it's called Translating the Body. And it, it has sea imagery like Tola Budis. And it has, um, I guess it has body imagery, obviously. And then it has cancer imagery thrown in. Translating the Body. Our organs sing in different keys like mermaids in a sea of blood. The body feels before it knows. Easier to guess disease in leaves drooping from unseen root rot or mold. The body feels before it knows rain's coming, it's sensed in the bones or in vessels flooding the head. Our organs sing in different keys, major for liver and lungs, minor for tonsils and thymus gland. The body feels before it knows the language of dormant cells awakening, spreading like jimson weed. Our organs sing in different keys, shipwrecked in growing storms, defiant and desperate for places to hide. Our organs sing in different keys, 
the body feels before it knows. Thank you. Shifting to Chala Buli, who actually appeared with me in a Zoom call and read some of these poems in French and English. And it was breathtaking to hear him. He appeared with Naveen Kishore from Seagull Books and the three of us read together. And when I hear, when I read these poems, I hear his voice there. I'm going to start with one of his prose poems that really seems to explain his approach to this terrible and horrible commentary about millions and millions of these coolies thrown into ships with cargo holes. And the only thing they could see from the cargo hold were the stars. So he writes about that. And they were thrown all together, mostly from India and China. And they, the caste system broke down. Everyone was sharing utensils. So it really created a new kind of humanity there. And they came to Mauritius in ships and then were sent to the colonies after slavery had been abolished. So there's an overlapping of the history of slavery and indentured workers. The same ships that carried the slaves carried the coolies to the colonies, the British colonies, the French colonies all over the world and some stayed in Mauritius. And that's why in Mauritius, I haven't been there, but I wanna be there. Is there a Club Med you said? Yeah. Um, that's why the largest percentage of population in, in Mauritius is from India. So this poem kind of sums it all up in a nutshell. Um, not too many word play word games here, but this is Cal. Coolitude, worker bees of the colonies, you were merchandise and we merchandising or vice versa. Coolitude, because my shores teem with new traces of memory. And if African gestures came to our hands as we cut the cane, the cracking and dancing of fingers remained ours, used to the tabla, often attuned to the Rabban's great cry of hearts adrift. Coolitude, because I am Creole by my rigging, Indian by my mast, European by my spar, Mauritian by my quest, and French by my exile. I always will be elsewhere only within myself because I can only imagine my native land. My native lands? In our tongues, we're at the fertile frontier of codes to hear a word among the exchanges of masters and slaves. Is this why my true mother tongue is poetry? Why my only native land is the earth? That's why I am ready to quell all border quarrels so all may see our star and share our common heritage, flesh and blood. So these word games, oh my gosh. They have kept me up nights. That's why I don't sleep. It's during Tarabuli's word play and what he's done. And he takes the word coolie and he does crazy things with that. He has um, sounds, um, alliterations going on. And what I do is a sound map before I translate anything, not only with Carl, but just looking at what kinds of patterns. I can't really reproduce the exact patterns or the exact sounds, but I try to get that thickness of texture of sounds. And some of you, and, and, and thank you audience for, for coming, and some of you I know very well and I appreciate your being here. Some of you have heard my sound mappings thing, and that's a picture of, of this next poem in the sound mapping, where the colors that have a similar Assonance or highlight, highlighted, I highlight them in a cult in the same color. Um, like in this upcoming poem, is the en sound. It exists in French, en, en, but it does not exist in English. But he uses barong, long, mong, coulissant, talon, manque, 
So I can't not pay attention to that sound. He also then has several competing sound patterns like lun and un, and he's got some some um, e sounds. So he's got rive, derive, and then with derive followed closely by rev. So he's got so much going on, overlapping. He's a brilliant, brilliant language expert, and yet he, he makes it whole. So I'm going to read this first, um, first one in French, and it's, it's, and of course, the word Varang, and they don't have titles, they don't have much punctuation at all, but Varang is, he, he writes, I guess I write, I wrote in my translator notes, Varang is a French word as well as a Hindi word. That means veranda. It also refers to the floor plate of a boat situated perpendicularly over the keel. So he's got these homonyms that look and sound the same but have different meanings. He uses homophones that sound the same but look differently and sound differently. He makes up words. And this one I'm going to read in French, which is has no title. Sur la varangue, ma langue cherche une mangue. Petite lune sur ma de une, ma langue. Raconte ma traversée coulissante. Au coulis, palant, pouli, dix lumières pour vérité. Sur la varangue, la mangue sur ma langue, je manque à l'appel, mon cœur. Comment guider le gouvernail et donner ta chair à toute rive, à des rives, à tes rêves? Oh, coulis, palant, coulis. Réduisez la voilure, cassez le vent de mémoire et filochez par cœur arraché. Je connais ce chant, je connais l'Odyssée. Oh, coulis, palant, coulis. And I decided not to use veranda, but to keep the varong, because you need that to help make this poem. On the varong, my tongue seeks a mango, and I'm harangued by a small topmast moon. Tell the tale of my curried crossing. Oh, capstan, pulley, coolie, say light for truth. On the varong, mango under my tongue, I miss roll call, my heart reels. How to steer the rudder and give your flesh to all shores, all drifts, to your dreams. Oh, coolie, capstan, coolie. Reef the sails, break the wind of memories frayed by uprooted hearts. I know this song, I know the odyssey. Oh, crating, capstan, coolie. So he's got, um, I guess, some um, you know how you know what you're going to read and then you change your mind because you have to fit with what Curtis has read and wonderful to be reading with Curtis and uh, you want to have resonance there. And um, and these are dark poems like Curtis's dark poems. So we, we've got that going here. So he takes the word coolie and he plays with it. And what he does is he takes coolie and in one of the poems he, he says coup, coup lié, which is a tied up neck. Coup is neck in French. So I had to come up with something to go with coolie. So I came up with cool lee, you know, the lee side of a, a ship. So the cool lee side of the ship and the other side is called something else. I learned all this ship terminology so I could draw it to come up with, to, to, to be able to address this, this wordplay. Um, at one point he talks about um, a parrot sail. And that was something that it turns out there's something in English called a, um, a screecher sail. And so there's a lot of su subtlety there that only if you read the footnotes 
and maybe not even then, do you know what's going on here and trying to deal with this humor and what's going on. Um, this one has no name either. Define me, please. What's a coolie? One with a noose round his neck denied the deck's coolly side. I am Lascar, Malabar, Madras Tamarin from bazaars, Telugu with tell tales for you, cruel Marathi mother or Shamar, whichever you like. I'm an Indian black guinea pig from Port Louis to Port of Spain to replace mighty Zanzibar slaves. For memory, my only languti, a loin cloth. My language, purloined by the sea. If you recognize me, please call me proxy slave, straw man, or stand in. Kapok from fields or ocean vertebrae. But know that my saber of blood has uprooted me to the core. And I think I'll read one more. And this is the last poem in the book. And another prose poem. He intersperses poems with the prose and, and not the prose. And I'm trying to cancel my clock from ringing. Okay. Coolitude, not just for the memory, the past of our first crossing of Earth but also for those human values amassed by the island from encounters with sons and daughters of Africa, India, China, and the Occident. My only dreamt homeland, the great brotherhood of humanity, of reconciliation. For this part of ourselves that we must compose in the light of day with an eye to human destiny waiting to be fulfilled. Once again, I propose we be porters of futures, worker bees of worlds, sowers of languages, builders of bridges connecting continents poised for a healthy sharing. Know yourself so you can build better together. For memory regained is a great plan for the future. What other truth can there be that carries the weight of a word handed down from the ship's lookout post. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of our poets tonight. Uh, it seems like we do have a little more time. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, if someone wants to put a couple in there, that would be great. We, I will unmute the poets and we will, uh, let's see, Barbara, Curtis, and I think we're all unmuted. Okay, uh, here it, it looks is. Like, it looks from, like there is one there yes. uh, from Bree. Okay, yes. When translating, how do you balance staying true to the meaning of the words and staying true to the rhythm of the poem? Good question. Um, the eternal question. Yeah. Okay. Feel free to jump in, um, Nancy Curtis. Well, I think. I mean, um, I mean, I, as Barbara said, the eternal question. Um, but I, there's always a choice, right? We always have to make choices, and and there are times when. I mean, you can't make the same sound as as Nancy was saying in in English. But I mean, I, I think about echoes of sounds that maybe maybe there's a certain rhythm or there's a certain rhyme in the Spanish or a sonic quality to the to the poem that you know is impossible to duplicate, but I can create something that's going to have a similar effect. And um, the poets that I work with are usually more interested in sound than they are in meaning, um, where I can, I can change the meaning of something to work on, uh, give greater emphasis to the sound. So, you know, but I also have 
have conversations with the writers I translate. I'm, I'm lucky, lucky, or I mean, that's a choice that I've made to, to translate people who are alive and so I can talk to them. Curtis, is that a choice to, um, or that you choose to translate poets who yeah. are more into sound than meaning? Oh, in that sense, no, I don't think so. I, um, no. I mean, that usually comes in a conversation that, that I arrive at after I've decided to, to start working on translating them. And for me, I normally don't translate poets who are more interested in sound and language. Uh, so this was, this was something new for me. Um, and, I, and, I, and I found with, with well, I, I translated René Schall. And René Schall is this dense, mysterious, surrealistic type poet, though he disavowed surrealism. So for me, it seemed easier that I could translate what was there and pay attention to the sounds. And then I didn't really understand what he was saying half the time, but I didn't have to. And I didn't have to make those semantic leaps for the reader. With Carl, <laughs> I guess I wanted to get, I had to get the sounds in. I had to, you can't translate this book without really rhymes and, and sounds and making up words. And in some ways the meaning didn't matter as much though I made it matter. And I made sure that the words I was pulling out to have a C alliteration were ship words, um, but maybe they weren't the exact ship words that he was having or with the, the coulier. To, to get the neck tied, um, it, I can't do a one for one. But I think for me, the, the overarching goal of translation is to get the effect of the poem and to be as close as possible to the original. So I do labor over it and do spend days trying to figure out a way to get around something that seems like a crucial part in a particular poem. And so really the answer is that we are, we, we, we probably have a process, but we also, we also change the process mm -hmm. for who we're translating. And we look to see what's the salient issue. Here, language and wordplay is one of the salient issues. And I choose poets who have very sonorous poems. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of limiting who I'm translating. I'm, I'm wanting them to appeal to my sense. But on the other hand, um, sometimes I don't choose. So I'm translating some Spanish, a Cuban poet, and it's co-translation. So my co-translator chose it. And I'm like, OK, let me see here, here where I am. And she doesn't make as much use of sounds. So I still sound map because I have to. I'm obsessed with it. And in Spanish, all the ah, ana, ala, everything ends with a's or o's. And um, so I want to get that texture of sound in there anyway. Some of it is, is just because it's Spanish, just like it's just because it's French. But you can tell if she means it on purpose when she takes a significant word that isn't really having the characteristic endings of Spanish words and puts that in and makes it resonate with another word. OK. Well, tagging into that, how do you, uh, Susan asks, how you choose or find or meet the poets that you translate? Um, Curtis, how do you do that? Uh, usually it starts with reading, uh, where I, I discover them through, you know, it could be, you know, just browsing a bookstore, but also reading literary supplements in the newspapers. I travel a lot. I mean, I, uh, Barbara mentioned that in her introduction. Um, so, you know, I live part of my time in Spain. And uh, I was in I was in Argentina several years ago and and met a lot of writers when I was there. Uh, but one in particular, I'm I started translating, not really planning on. I discovered one of his books in a bookstore in Buenos Aires, a writer from Mexico named Fabio Moravito, and I started translating some of his short pieces, and then that turned into translating his short stories. And I have a novel of his, it's coming out in November. 
And now, you know, I'm just, I translate all of his prose. But uh, another book that I have coming out next year, it's a memoir by a Spanish veterinarian writer uh, that, you know, I discovered by reading a review of it. And I bet it's first. because you have a dog that you're very fond of <laughs> and that you travel with everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that helps, yeah. But um, but it's just, it's one of those things where I think just reading and, and, and now I can kind of choose, right? Before, um, you know, I was just throwing everything out and just saying, hey, do you have a translator? And now it's people come to me and the book found you. The book found yeah. you. Yeah. Nancy, um, I think you were talking about that earlier, but uh, Karen has a question about how your Creole poet's language co is comparable to what we know as language poets. So that's an interesting question. Um, and there are, there's some overlap there. In my mind, though, I don't know that the, the language poets are out necessarily to be humorous and do verbal acrobatics um, for the sake of it. Uh, they do they do their thing, and um, you look and you go, "Huh?" After you read the the line, but I think I think there's there's definitely a difference. Plus, they not necessarily have. Um, something that they are trying to underscore the tragedy of. And so you can have uh, more of on an even keel with a, a uh, language poet's poem, not necessarily dealing with something horribly tragic. I think you can run the gamut. So depending on the theme and the topic of the, the poem, um, that would change. Whereas here, he's definitely underscoring the most horrific tragedies with this fun and games to to lure you in so that you'll read and you'll you'll see. But in the book, they're they're poems with um, the, the blood left by um, one of the the um, the folks the the folks who were the sailors who were transporting the coolies and bashing their head into the the floor and the, the, the side. And um, so I see that as a difference. Uh, it's an interesting question though. Yeah. Okay, we have um, time for one more with quick answers. Um, what are some of the ways that translations affect your own writing? It makes uh, me think a lot about about syntax and word choice. I think it's pretty obvious in the poem that I read um of mine but also you know it just it makes me a much more conscientious writer reviser and you know mm -hmm. gives me something to think about okay Naomi and for me um it really opens things up so I, I never wrote prose poems before I started translating René Char and by being so involved in that poem you you then get a sense of the craft and the process that was involved in in writing it. So I feel like the the writers I translate do influence me. Obviously, I influence them in terms of how I bring them across in English through my own aesthetic as well. So it's it's a kind of reciprocal process going on. And sometimes my favorite is when I've looked at it so analytic analytically. And then I can say to the poet, is that a typo? Or <laughs> did you mean to say that? And sometimes I am right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you both. Um, this We've come to the end of our program. And I'd like to uh, thank you all on behalf of Cafe Muse, Barbara, Curtis, and Nancy Naomi. Those were, not only fine, but they were fascinating and interesting. And I learned a lot uh, about uh, translations and about the cultures that you were all talking, reading about. Right. We'd like you all to join us for our upcoming WordWorks reading. Our next Poets versus the Pandemic is Wednesday, August 18th, 2021 at 7 p.m. We're featuring Christine 
Pam reading her new book, Gorilla, and with our guest, Indran Amir Thanaya Dam. Did I say it right? I hope. <laughs> and Lilo Way. Registration is free, but you need to do it. So uh, get the Zoom link from, I'm going to put it in the chat, from the chat and then register for the reading. Then we'll send you the Zoom. Um, a link again a few days before the reading. Please share it with your friends, but not with social media so that we don't have Zoom bombers, which is a new thing, I guess. Our next Cafe Muse is Monday, September 13th, featuring Andrea Carter Brown and Katherine Gecker. We'll send you a reminder Zoom link shortly before that reading. Um, past readings for Cafe Muse, Joaquin Miller, and Poets versus the Pandemic are on our YouTube channel, Cafe Muse. So just go to the YouTube, click on Cafe Muse, and you'll get to see a lot of wonderful readings. You can also check us out on Facebook, Cafe Muse. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank our wonderful poets tonight, Curtis and Nancy Naomi, and thank you all for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and good night.